Hello, thank you for joining us, FCLT Global, in the sixth episode of our monthly webinar on investment risk. Our subject today is the ramifications of investment risk management on income volatility and distribution. That's a mouthful. You might also say it's ways in which investors affect society and society can affect investors as well. We appreciate you being here with us today. We have an excellent panel joining us, including Jui Dewan, the Chief Economist from Wellington, Ben Falk, Director at EYQ, in-house think tank for the accounting firm EY, and Brian Lewis, the Chief Investment Officer of US Steel. This is the exact right panel for the conversation that we're having today because each of these folks represents organizations that are involved in moving money in long-term directions based on insights and research like we're going to discuss today. That's the reason why FCLT Global exists, moving money in long-term directions, and also why we've done our research on risk and convened these webinars. By way of reminder, the content that we fall back on in producing this series is our own research about managing investment risk across multiple time horizons. That's called Balancing Act and is available on our website. There's also some related research in our publication about institutional investment mandates. Those of you who are following our research on risk closely can also go to our blog and see news about the relaunch of that research. This is news since we last gathered in January about how we'll be involved in the research of investment risk in a second phase effort. A few programming notes before we get into our panel discussion today. Bryn Costello produces this series for us. She can take your questions for me to weave into the conversation and also perhaps answer your questions if there's any technical challenges. You can reach Bryn by email at Bryn, B-R-Y-N dot Costello at fcltglobal.org. I believe that Bryn will also put her email address in the chat function. You may also use that function to submit questions. We are recording today's session to archive on our website in the spirit of continuing professional development. The last thing I'll say before returning to our panel is that this is an hour long session. We'll get you out of here promptly in 60 minutes and on with your day. So now let's dive in. Ben, I'd like to give the first question to you since you've done the research that brings us together today. Can you help us understand how we can statistically describe the changing macro distributions of investment returns and societal income in relation to one another? And also how we can think about individuals resulting experiences? Thanks, Matt. And thanks to the whole FCLT who've been great, great partners in the research and um, also to the to the other panelists and the everyone else who's joining today. Um, so, yeah, if uh, if you, you, you look at the chart chart here, it's a it's a, a, a theme that you might have heard in, in macroeconomics, which is known as the great moderation. And what this what this means uh, empirically uh, in, in numbers is that if you take the, the quarter on quarter or the year on year uh, percent change in in GDP, um, and calculate the standard distribution, uh, standard deviation of that change. Uh, what you see is that volatility has has declined on a trend basis since about the 1970s, right? And you know, central banks like to pat themselves on the back for for achieving this, um, but it seems like there's there's a little bit more to the story here. And so, you know, a, a key question is: has has this volatility declined declined for everyone? And so, of course, you know, GDP is an is an aggregate, uh, and you can decompose it in a few different ways: uh, on the demand side, on the supply side, and then on the on the income side. And so, the the demand side is what you you see all the time: C plus G plus BI plus 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 NX, um, consumption, government spending, business investment, and net exports. Uh, the supply side is your is is your labor force: how many people you who you have who, who are working, um, their their labor utilization, which is basically how many hours a week they work. And then uh, labor productivity, which is the productivity of each of those hours, um, and then you can on the on the income side, um, you can do it as labor income and, and capital income. Um, and so, uh, if you look at the do the same analysis, so take a quarter on quarter, a year on year, on year change um, for these subcomponents of GDP. One uh, subcomponent has actually experienced an increase in volatility over the last four decades or so. And you can click to the click to the next slide, um, uh, and what we 
what we see is that uh, household income volatility uh, has been has been rising. Um, and so there's a, a, a been documented first in, in around 2012 by uh, Harvard's uh, Karen Dine and Doug Elmendorf. Uh, and what they show is that this has actually gone up about 30% between 1970 and 2008. Uh, and then after the great financial crisis, we have uh, some extension of their analysis and it shows that income volatility has continued to rise in the years after. Um, and with the disruptions to income um, that we've seen uh, uh, over the last year or so, we could uh, presume that uh, 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 this trend has continued. And so if you, th you think about, about you know, um, uh, household income as, as, as an asset, right? Uh, think about the monthly salary uh, as coupons to a bond, right? And then think about what it means for you as a portfolio manager, uh, how you would respond if an asset that you held had, had cash flows that were growing increasingly volatile over time. And so volatility is just one way to, to uh, describe the risk. Um, you can flip to the next slide, sorry. Yeah, so this is the e evidence from Elmendorf and, um, and Dynan and then the extension. And you can see that volatility has gone up over the last, last uh, four decades or so. And, and you can go to the next slide now as well. And so uh, with, in addition to, to looking at just the volatility, you can actually calculate the, uh, the, the skewness and the kurtosis of, of this uh, uh, stream of cash flows. And what we see uh, again is that um, uh, household income has, has become uh, uh, increasingly negatively skewed and also leptokurtic, meaning a, 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 a highly peaked uh, distribution with, with relatively fatter, fatter tails. And so this is all a, a complicated way of saying that household in incomes have grown much riskier over the last four decades. And because that has happened during a period of declining overall macroeconomic volatility, not only are households bearing more risk, they're bearing a larger share of total risk that's prevalent in the economy uh, than they were uh, four, four decades ago. And so this seems like, to me, one of the most underappreciated uh, facts in macroeconomics, that, that uh, uh, everyone assumes that the last uh, four decades have been a great moderation, but uh, it's not true for, for significant segments of our society uh, who have experienced increasingly risky, risky incomes. Um, that's, that's the last one. Yeah, so we'll just, just go. So this, has, this links to a whole a, a host of different things. And, and the, the goal here is really to throw it open to questions so that everyone has a chance to weigh in. But, uh, but the, the first is, is, is that you know, there's, we can think about some of the corporate governance and, and risk management practices that are prevalent um, in, in, in big firms. And uh, we wonder if there's a squeeze the balloon effect going on here where uh, firms are mitigating risk for themselves, but effectively pushing it onward onto other stakeholders in society. And so an example of that might be the shift from defined benefit to defined contribution pension schemes, right? Where the residual risk is effectively borne by the household, the, 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 the income labor, labor uh, worker, uh, as opposed to the firm. Another is like, is the shift to, to zero hours contracts or the gig economy, uh, right? Uh, uh, an income that, uh, a salaried worker that earns $1,000 a month uh, 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 over, over 12 months, so 12 grand a year, who shifts to a, a, a lumpier income, $3,000 every three months or $6,000 every, every six months. So the same annual income is a more volatile income stream. And so uh, these type of practices, you know, how much of this is, is, is risk shifting versus, versus risk mitigation? Um, the other is, is you know, are, are we trading mild versus wild risk? I mean, are we are we sort of uh, uh, saying this is good in the short term, but actually in the long term, what you're creating is a much larger, much more significant left tail, uh, such as you know the, the polarization we're streaming, we're seeing uh, political extremism and other other types of social conflict. Um, uh, uh, the 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 third is is that um, uh, w w linking this to the global shortage of safe assets, and so uh, as uh, household risk, household income becomes more volatile, it's likely that households want to de-risk their financial portfolios. Uh, they're unlikely to want to take a, 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 to, adopt, uh, to buy highly risky assets when, they're, when their household income is, is growing more volatile over time. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've seen that, that there's been cumulative, basically zero retail uh, inflows into the equity market since the 2008-2009 financial crisis, right? And so there's, it suggests that, you know, uh, households are not interested in such risky assets. What we've seen instead is a bunch of corporate bonds being issued and uh, uh, companies buying back their stock and retiring it, effectively doing a substitution uh, to meet the demand for, for a safer asset. 
Um, and then the, the last is, you know, can this conversation help with the conversation around inequality, which, you know, mostly focuses the, on redistribution as the solution space. Uh, and that's because we, we're focusing on outcomes, right? Uh, wealth and income inequality. But actually, if you think about it in risk terms, right? Uh, uh, how are we as society allocating these risks that arrive? Like when a pandemic arrives, right? Uh, who deserves to lose their job in a pandemic? Well, well, no one, but our institutions collectively channel these risks to specific groups and that has is showing up in 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 household income risk over time and so uh yep with that i'll hand it back to you matt thank you ben I, you really set the table richly for us brian i'm going to go to you first because i heard a couple of things in ben's statement that make me think of the allocator perspective first is the use of the word how we allocate risk but then also the idea that if households are bearing more of it, that must mean someone else is bearing less of it. So I'd like to ask a high level question about how you see it as an allocator, and then see also if there's tie-ins that you might observe to things like capital market assumptions or expected return projections or underlying volatility estimates related to these patterns. No, thank you, Matt, for the question. And uh, it's a pleasure to be on this panel and to, to have this conversation this morning. As I, as I think about many of the statistics and the trends that, that Ben uh, presented and we've been talking, I, I think about it from a couple different perspectives. Um, I, and, and one, I'll answer it in within three veins. One is as a, as a corporate officer uh, of a company that has been around 420 years and, and has uh, both a, a workforce and a community presence uh, uh, in, in America. Two, as a, as a investor who has seen a risk shift, which I agree with completely from the, the institution to the, to the individual. And then three, I'll answer uh, as an allocator and, and some of those trends uh, that, that have that have taken place over the years. So, so one is as a corporate officer, this contract of um, stability that was, I think, very much at the fabric of employment and, and society uh, for a number of years has shifted tremendously. You know, this concept of work for an organization or an industry, there's a certain level of expectation around income and growth of income, either based on uh, a GDP or, or other cost of living in increase, that 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 was a long-term investment in both people and process, and what I like to say, community. That has shifted over the years from a long-term focus, which I know this organization is focused on, to unfortunately more of a quarterly, quarter by quarter shareholder value uh, time frame and, and perspective. And so with that, you've, you've seen employment stability erode and, and by tangential effect, you've seen income uh, and what I call community economic stability uh, uh, erode as well. As an investor, what we've seen with a significant amount of uh, monetary and fiscal policy and, and changes that, that have impacted the economies uh, over the, the last 30 or 40 years, I've seen this bifurcation between those uh, individuals and organizations with assets and the ability to take on risk and those who, as Ben stated, are uh, less willing to take on risks and focus on maintaining a, a core or corpus uh, of assets. And what's interesting in that narrative, and then I'll get to the allocator perspective, is that for investors who've had the ability to take on risk, take on uh, emerging markets, emerging investment strategies, things that have developed most recently, for example, coming out of the great financial crisis like direct lending or uh, other private credit or uh, alternative strategies that are only open to sophisticated and or institutional 
investors have seen um, a pretty stable uh, investment growth and opportunities to, to meet investment objectives. But then finally, that, that retail investor or that individual where that risk has shifted from a DB world where the employer and to some degree uh, other invest, institutional investors provided a stable and predictable uh, outcome with some variation, you've seen the erosion of not only defined benefit plans, but you've seen the erosion of company or, or plan sponsored insurance. You've seen the, the erosion of contributions um, into these plans. And in many ways, the individual is now left with during the, doing the majority of the retirement planning. What most people don't realize is when DC plans were actually created, the, the philosophy at that time was it would be a part of a three-legged stool. Most folks would have a defined benefit pension, you, you, you would have a some sort of social security safety net, and then there would be a third leg of defined contribution where individuals yeah. had an ability to augment that. So now you're seeing uh, maybe one to one and a half of those legs uh, with any predictability. And I think that's providing more volatility and, and, and insecurity for the end user. And, and at the end of the day, my role and my function, I think, in this process is to provide for stability, to invest for stability on behalf of the participants, which I think has a compounding effect to provide stability in the community. Brian, I appreciate that a whole lot. Thank you for bringing it up to that culminating point. Julie, I'd like to get you involved here. You, of course, represent an asset management organization where all of these decisions affect the way that you do business. But the question I have for you is your ability also to control and have agency in these decisions also. What can a manager do to help create focus on the long term of the way that these macro risks are managed? And where are the limits of that control? Great, great questions, Matt. So I would say, um, you know, our research, which is the hallmark of, of how we invest at Wellington, really tries to think about the medium term and tries to think about what are stationary or stable assumptions to be mm -hmm. uh, and what are assumptions that we should constantly challenge ourselves on. And, and really debate how they're shifting over time. And so the inequity within the um, US economy has become more and more prominent in the last many years. And one of the things as an economist that I've spent time focusing on and, and talking about extensively is um, how election results has, uh, have manifested themselves to reflect that increasing inequality we are seeing more often changes at the top of the administration. And of course, uh, because of what, trend, what has happened with the pandemic, we are now seeing some very extensive shifts in government spending. So before I go into any of that, I want to say, you know, our job is to think about how those assumptions are going to shift, to share with clients what we are seeing, and to uh, really have that dialogue that, that thinks about uh, what the how the future may look different than what we're seeing currently. The limitations that you ask about are that we really are given mandates by our clients. Um, mm -hmm. So it is not our job always to allocate across asset classes. We are specifically asked to manage a specific asset class or a specific type of fund within an asset class. And so uh, the research is available to all our clients and we will discuss and debate with them, but some of those decisions are actually not in our hands. And that's something that, you know, as a fiduciary, again, we try to balance both of those out, but we have to be true to our clients and manage the uh, assets in the way that, that they ask us to do. So 
a uh, little bit of education, a little bit of thinking about how we can make those uh, shifting assumptions part of how we invest, but also being true to what we've been asked to do. Thank you for that. I'd like at the end of our session to come back to that matter of the assumptions that are made within the models, because that seems to be the intersection point between a higher level conversation about the way the macro economy moves and practical actions that we can take as long term investors to understand that and also to potentially to influence that. I made a note as I was preparing for this about a statement that was given to FCLT a couple of months ago. Sarah Williamson, our CEO, runs a podcast uh, and we had Leo Strike, the former Chief Justice of the Delaware Supreme Court on that podcast, I think in November. I commend it to anyone who wants to go and look, but I have this in reserve, uh, Dewey, for the exact sorts of points that you just made. Justice Shrine commented to Sarah at that time that the share of profits that have gone into worker pay from increases in productivity and profitability has gone way down in the last 30 years and activist pressures have, put a, have been a big part of that. This has created much greater economic insecurity in the US and led to nativist appeals. I'd like to give you the chance to react to that if you want. And then Ben, I also want to call you back into the conversation. You use the phrase squeeze the balloon effect. And I wonder if this is where we start to see risk moving through the system. But Jimmy, let me allow you to address that first. So I think about the US economy in a global context. We are a global system, which is interconnected in many more ways than we used to be in the past. One of the biggest changes that the, that the global economy has witnessed has been uh, the increase in the supply of labor that came about when, the, when China entered the WTO. Mm -hmm. We had a similar shift that occurred when we brought down the wall and the former communist countries joined the labor force. So if we start to think about many of the um, issues that we see in the US economy or in the labor market in a context of a dramatic increase in the labor supply mm -hmm. globally, mm -hmm. we might see that the decisions that were made by some companies to offshore or the decisions made to uh, to actually become more efficient in a supply chain basis were really uh, quote unquote rational from a corporate standpoint, given that the mandate of each company is to ensure that they are making, again, uh, cost savings and ensuring profitability as, as far as possible for uh, their shareholders. I mean, again, we have to think about the mandate of each entity and, and what they're reacting to. So I often think that um, massive increase in the supply of the global labor force is underestimated for the ripple mm. effects it's had on mm. the um, on the U.S. economy in terms of what we've seen uh, transpire, especially at the lower end of mm. occupations where where um, skills can be more easily replaced elsewhere. Thank you for that, Ben. Are we squeezing the balloon? Yeah, yeah. I think I think in, in, we are basically. Um, you know, so uh, I note that the, the Pentagon recently cited shareholder capitalism as a as a national security risk in a paper. And so it speaks to exactly what you're talking about, uh, uh, Jui, which is so, so eloquently put, is that it's a coordination failure. At the firm level, it sounds rational to do this. But at the country level, actually, what you're doing is is uh, it, it does, doesn't make sense at all. And so uh, this is really the role, uh, a role for government is to help coordination. And so we I think we've, we've, we've done, done a poor job at that. Um, uh, you, you know, there's um, if if you think about at the at the firm level, the decisions the decisions that they make. You know, the way the way I like to I like to analogize it is, you know, a, a macroeconomic risk could be could be anything. You could think about it in, as a natural disaster, an earthquake, or or a flood. Um, and and so you know, uh, imagine there's two two towns, a, a wealthy town and a and a poor town, and there's a great a great flood coming. And the wealthy town has two options. They could dig a, a pond that hold, collects and holds all the water, or they could dig a channel, which is cheaper, but just diverts the water to the neighboring town. Right? Uh, how, how are we treating unexpected risks when they arrive, like a, like a pandemic? 
uh, you know, how are we channeling that flood water and onto which which groups? Well, what we've seen is that, you know, underprivileged groups have suffered the most in this in this crisis. Uh, women have suffered uh, relatively more, more than men. Children are, are, are suffering tremendously. Child hunger in the U.S. is up. Poverty is up. You know, so uh, uh, those things really shouldn't happen during an unexpected event that's no one's fault right uh and so what it suggests to me is that you know instead of not having enough uh, redistribution what we don't have is enough is enough safety nets we don't have enough things to catch people when these type of events happen especially in the scenario that our institutions are are are, are sort of uh you know pushing it onto them uh, uh by the way you know, the, by, by the incentive structures that they're creating here so i'll force the own this back on to us, of course, there's an organization that exists between the corporate level and the government level, and that is the investor level of capital allocation. Ben, I want to return to a point that you made on one of your earlier slides about just how you can compose GDP, including between labor income and capital income. If we know that volatility at the macro level has declined, and the volatility at the household level has increased, something must be moderating that. And the only thing left in the equation is capital income. I'd like to ask both of the investors on the panel, Dewey and Brian, what this looks like from your perspective. Is this something that's visible? Can you see it in the way that you do your work or is it not? Brian, perhaps I'll go to you first. You're, you are, there you go. Yeah. So as, as I think about it, it is, it is visible from the, the, the work as a operating company. And it, it is, and, and, and Ben touched on it in this broad concept of companies thinking about its resources and use of resources and showing up its balance sheet and mitigating the risk or expense on its balance sheet. But I, I think I, I take that, Matt, as to say that to some degree comes at an, at an expense to the uh, employee and community mm. because it is showing up uh, in a vacuum, uh, as, as Julie spoke about, um, without thinking about the ramifications or the, the downstream or the ripple effect that would, would take, a pl take place based on that, that overall reduction of, of risk. The, the other nugget I'd like to throw in here uh, is we, again, focus on the, the individual Mm -hmm. I've read two studies. One that says folks don't have $400 or $1,200 for an emergency uh, saved up. And so um, I won't belabor the point, but there is clearly a disconnect between uh, mitigating financial risk at the employer or, or, or mm -hmm. macro corporate level and then how we think about investing not only our own assets, but investing uh, retirement or, 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 or life saving assets for individuals that are connected to us. I'll, I'll come back to it uh, if, if you'd like, but I'll pause for Julie. Brian actually has said it so well. I don't know that I have much more to add to that. I thought that was excellent, Brian. Um, I, I really think it's about, um, you know, we spend so much time considering a base case, but then considering all the alternative scenarios, right? If I just think about it in pure investing terms, you're mm -hmm. thinking about all those scenarios and those scenarios and the range of outcomes because of this instability or the increased volatility in, in that income stream have grown over time or are more extreme over time because we, we're kind of keeping those in our, you know, possibility, realm of possibility kind of keeps widening out because of that. And I think, again, what we do as fiduciaries for what we are being mandated to do is very different than solving for the entire society at the same time, right? So, so it's about the challenge of what is your mandate <laughs> versus 
who's taking care of ensuring that, that we're not facing these things? To Brian's point, I would just say, why is $400 not enough? Well, think about all the changes on healthcare. We haven't even touched that, right? We talked about pensions, but healthcare is a big part of why uh, so many families uh, struggle when that healthcare spend is not available to them or fewer plans or higher uh, you know, co-pays or um, that, that each family is having to take care of. Brian, I want to give you the space to unpack that idea more if, if you would like. It sounded like you might. Well, it, it, to tie it more to investment assumptions and, and those knowns and things that, that we manage that have been discussed, I'll just focus on one, uh, expected return, right? We've seen this tremendous trend of lowering of expected return and reducing volatility in most institutional portfolios to try to uh, create some level of predictability, whether it be matching duration to mm -hmm. your liability, matching cash flows to your required uh, payments to participants, thinking about funding levels from a PBGC or an actuarial point of view to remain healthy enough so that you don't have to contribute more assets but if you think about all of those conversations around institutional risk, what happens and what gets lost is, okay, how does this impact the person that is looking forward to a check for now and in, in for the rest of their lives or their family lives? And that, right, that's the contract that the individual signs up for but it's a contract that has just changed and been altered through negotiation and renegotiation and union involvement and mm -hmm. employer groups and the political instability and philosophy, I would say, that has come into that very basic premise of a stable economy has not only stable institutions, but stable families. And, and there's a financial capability and stability kind of baseline that should be higher than, than $400. But, but I think there's a, there's a disconnect between not only the quarterly or short-term view of investing, but also that contract, that, that human contract of how do we tie these assumptions in this data to an overall better performing and less volatile society? And so I don't know all the answers and haven't studied it a great deal, but as when I think about the investments that we look to make, it's keeping that balance and that perspective in mind to say, we can solve for a lot of risk. And as we know with actuarial math and even some legislation that's being proposed now as it relates to uh, changing the ability to, to smooth assets, we know that there's, there are many ways mathematically to mitigate risk within a portfolio and a lot of smart people doing it. But when you get back to that fiduciary duty and you get back to what you're really solving for, I think that fundamentally has not changed. Mm -hmm. I think, unfortunately, institutional investors have maybe taken their eye off that ball a little bit. And that, that's what your organization is uh, trying to get us back focused on, right? I, I appreciate that commendation, Brian, and also the transition point. I'd like to draw out a theme that I hear in the conversation, and that is an acknowledgement that the distribution of risk looks the way that been described, that that may not be very purposeful for investors, uh, particularly at the front end of the value chain who have higher order responsibilities for the well-being of particular segments of society. But there's a latent question about whether we, an investor community, can do anything about it? Are we experiencing these changes or are we influencing these changes? Ben, I want to give this question 
to you first so as to not put our investors immediately on the spot. But let's ask the question about causality. Is there a relationship between these changing distributions of risk in your research? And then Brian and Julia, I'll give you the chance to respond if you would like. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I, I, I think there is, um, you know, labor market conditions have been linked to asset market pricing for a long time. There's a rich, rich literature on, on the topic, which is, you know, too big to, to succinctly, succinctly talk about here. But, you know, the one recent study that I saw, for example, looked at um, Swedish households and they had uh, detailed administrative data, including uh, uh, portfolio allocations and, and uh, bank statements to judge both their, their income and their risk tolerance. And what they showed is that when workers moved from a low volatility industry into a high volatility industry, so uh, a different, different, different sector of the sector of the economy, that um, uh, their, the uh, safe a- share of safe assets in their portfolio increased by about 30, 35% or roughly uh, $15,000 in equivalent terms. And so what is evidence for this type of type of de-risking effects? Now, you know, this, so the, the hard part is thinking about how that transmits through the rest of asset markets, right? And so Jui, Jui suggested, of course, that it, 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 this, is, this is equivalent to a decline in the, in the uh, equilibrium real rate, right? Uh, when you have a relative imbalance between safe and, ris- safe and risky assets, um, then, then the uh, equilibrium real rate has to decline. And so uh, what that suggests again is that, you know, central banks may not have accounted for this factor. And, and so the, perhaps that's why interest rates seem to have been uh, uh, perhaps too high and uh, a little bit too high. And that's why inflation has been, been so muted for the last few decades. So um, uh, I, that's really, the conversation gets really interesting is thinking through those second order effects and how it transmits the broader asset markets. Dewey, I see you nodding your head and I know that you have thoughts about these assumptions. So let me turn to you next. I, I think the... Um... Many of the things that we've just talked about really raise the question of what's the right policy to help society as a whole, right? Is it about central banks uh, lowering their assumptions, as Ben said, about what the what the uh, interest rate is that that the economy can operate on in ideal conditions, or is it also about the role of the government to step in if there's a pandemic, for instance? as we are seeing in the United States and spades now over the course of the last year, right? So um, the pandemic is obviously a very extreme event, but we've talked already about many things that have transpired uh, over the last 40 years, which have um, really had an impact on the uh, safety net in the United States. So if we start to see a shift between the policy between fiscal and monetary policy as an allocator, as someone thinking about the underlying assumptions, I start to change and think about what should the model include for the future. And I do believe uh, that we are starting to see something more fundamental take place because something common over the last 12 months of very distressed period for a lot of human beings around the world is that we are starting to see government step up in a way that we have not seen in a very, very long time. So we need to think about that because it could be that not only were central banks having to reevaluate the right interest rate, we might now be at the point where we have to think whether the shift towards more fiscal policy away from monetary policy actually means something for what that equilibrium interest rate looks like, what our underlying assumption about inflation looks like. These are things that I think a lot of people have not had to think about for a very long period of time because they have been trending, really Mm -hmm. trending one way. Um, And I think that the pandemic really has brought forth and opened up the what has been building for some time based on all the things that we've just talked about and what Ben's charts have shown and so on and forth. And once that has come out in the spotlight, and I think we saw it already with the election results in the United States, that that there is really a desire to see some shifts. And with those shifts in society, in terms of the actions that take place around us, we as investors need to rethink our assumptions, which is a very hard thing to do because these assumptions have been very stable and modeled for a long period of time. So, you know, it sounds 
okay, there's more fiscal, there's less monetary, or maybe the interest rate isn't quite here or there. These are huge assumptions for how we think about expected returns in the future. Brian, may I get your reaction to that? Absolutely. I, I think back to coming out of the crisis in, uh, in 2009 and the, the fiscal and monetary response at that time versus what we saw in the last 12 months uh, here and the, the market reactions. If we all recall, when 2008 was rearing its ugly head, there was a, a lot of panic and almost some uh, what we thought was a flight to quality, people realized was a correlated flight to to safety in my mind, right? Where, and things stalled. The amount of capital that was infused from 09 to 11 was infused in the US economy by the Treasury and Fed from March to, to May this year or, or this past year, right? And so, so you saw this, this immediate response reaction and you also saw a equity market that took years to stabilize and slowly track positive for the last 10 years. And, and, and many of our investor assumptions were, were based on that look back. You saw that same market have a precipitous fall and then a precipitous rise. Uh, where I remember our portfolio was at the end of March one of our portfolios was down roughly double digits. By the end of June, it was up double digits. And as, as an investor, keeping that discipline to say, stick to our asset allocation, stick, stick to what we know, even though this is, this is unknown, uh, and, and invest where you can, has been all a, a learning for the short time, uh, for the period of time over the last 12 years. This economic involvement uh, or stimulus broadly, both monetary and fiscally, has also on the scale has in the past years not really been seen since the World War II era here in the United States by, by way of infusion. Uh, of, of capital. Now, the question becomes, and, and I, I think the bifurcation, the investor community by and large has rebounded and we still continue to grapple with growth. We still continue to grapple with policy. We, we grapple with how we mitigate our risk. But then the, the broader economy, Wall Street's fine, Main Street is still trying to figure out how to adjust uh, to this new normal. And I think as investors in our portfolios, we have thought about how we try to not disconnect those opportunities, actually think about reconnecting and in the investments of, of how we, we're focused. I mean, this is low growth. This is we're largely fixed income investors. We're we're but you're not seeing the returns to meet even our lower target returns in those markets. So we have to get a little bit creative. But I'm hopeful in the sense, mm -hmm. Matt, that mm -hmm. this opportunity is one where we can focus more on real assets, more on commodities, more on diversified opportunities that I think are a lot more tangible that also have a greater connectivity to the broader economy. So we're going from what I would say paper investors and thinking about risk from a pure analytical or mathematic or formulaic mm -hmm. point of view to how do we now connect our decisions and our risk mitigation to the, the broader economy and participants. That feels profound, Brian. I'd like to hold that thought in mind for a moment and return to it toward the end of our conversation. I would observe as a programming note, we're entering the last quarter of the hour that we have together. So audience members can submit questions again via chat or to brand.costello at fcltglobal.org. I do have one question from the audience 
already. Several others that I also hope to get through. So we'll treat the last quarter of an hour like a lightning round and see how much territory we can cover. Brian, I do want at the risk of being obvious or maybe even pedantic to draw out some very straightforward and elementary points about the way that investing works and that this connects to the issues we've discussed today. The topic of rates has really been a theme for the last several minutes. That feeds in to expected returns and then those expected returns feed into estimates of volatility, the likelihood that you'll earn that return and also to asset allocation. I believe we're talking about some of the basic inputs about how an allocator chooses the way they distribute their capital. Is that right? I don't think there's a right or wrong, but the elements that you speak of are all very relevant and on the table. And yeah. I think that that cannot be ignored because there is a, a certain discipline and training that comes along with those inputs and we can't ignore them. I would just add, we have to take a look at them within the context of timing. Like Julie mm. talked a little bit about intermediate uh, environments we can't continue to focus on the 20 or 30 year model. We have to focus on a more dynamic investable universe. Julie, I'd like to give you the chance to respond to that and also to weave in the points that we bookmarked a few minutes ago about the assumptions that Wellington produces. I think that we feel like um, we serve our clients best by, by really thinking, as, as Ryan put it, in, in that intermediate time horizon. It takes time from when we start speaking with our clients to when a decision gets made. So if it's too tactical, it's hard to make a change. If it's too far out, it really can't make an impact for those who are thinking about, say, the final beneficiaries of a pension plan or so on and forth. So, so we really think about that intermediate time horizon as really important for our clients in, in making a shift. So assumptions to think about. What will be the future inflation rate? What will be the sh share of burden carried by policy between monetary and fiscal? What will be the right discount rate to think about? What are the demographic shifts taking place in the United States in particular between a retiring baby boomer generation and a rising millennial generation? What are the ramifications if the savings glut that has held true globally starts to dissipate over time? These are some of the key areas that I can, yeah. I'm just going to sketch out for you to think about. They're huge. That Each one of them, we spend a lot of time thinking about it. But when we're thinking about what what some of those um, tectonic shifts might occur in this coming decade. And again, we're, we're not going to think about the next 30 years because that's mm -hmm. really too long a time horizon. But even, you know, we, we kind of break it up two to three, then five, and then the decade dependent on, uh, on the investor. Those are a lot of assumptions to think about and think about how they're evolving. So we're spending a lot of time with our clients on it, internally on our own research and thinking about how our models need to evaluate for that. We're getting several questions coming in now. Ben, I do wanna get one more to you and then we'll give, I think most of the remainder of our time to audience questions. But you alluded in your opening presentation to the idea of substituting mild for wild risk. This is also the squeeze the balloon metaphor. I think it's important to unpack that idea for a moment because its implication is that capital may not have de-risked, but rather just re-risked or redistributed the risk that it faces. Do you have thoughts on that concept? Uh, sure. And I, so I think it, it, um, it's relevant for this debate around, um, you know, what comes after the U.S. dollar. It has, the, has the U.S. Uh, peaked in terms of its global economic and, and um, uh, is the Pax Americana over and are we seeing a new, a new counterbalance in China uh, who wants to issue their own reserve currency uh, and, and have digital plans alongside it in order to try and encourage, encourage that along? Well, uh, some, some historians argue that, um, you know, reserve currencies are sort of, sort of weird because why would any country want to use the currency of another country? 
right? It's a, it, it's a, it suggests that your own currency is incredible enough, right? So you're using another currency in order to store value. That's a, 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 a self-indictment. And so um, um, what, what, what is it that makes uh, someone else's currency more credible? Well, many people argue that it's a constraint on the executive branch of government. It's, a, it's, a, it's an institutional foundation that makes it very difficult for an executive to confiscate the savings that another country has, has deployed with you. Um, and so when people talk about this, um, 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 you know, uh, the shift away from the dollar and towards the, the, the RMB, they often talk about trade balances and financial flows and all those things matter for reserve currency adoption. But actually, uh, uh, there's political conditions that, are, that, that, are, that matter as well, right? Uh, it's a one-party state in China. And so uh, it, it's, it's not necessarily as credible as a, as a, as a more balanced in institution. Um, and so if you, you know, think about the type of political risks that we're seeing recently in the US with the rise of, of, of polarization and extremism, uh, well, we just had uh, uh, you know, a near scrape uh, in terms of uh, an institutional crisis in the US itself. Uh, and uh, many foreign countries have now said that you know, we'll never see the, America uh, in the same, same, way, same way again. Um, you know, that, that, the, that, the point is that that um, um, institutional weakness, weakness translates directly into the sovereign risk premium, into the borrowing rates that a government uh, can issue debt at, and therefore com comes directly into the equation about you know, uh, all these interest rate discount assumptions that investors are using in their frameworks. And so are we trading mild versus wild? You, I think you bet we are. Uh, it, we may not see it because of uh, a cert certain other effects in financial markets, but uh, I think uh, the, the political volatility is suggestive that, uh, that these, are, um, uh, these are, are gonna come home to roost. I appreciate that, thank you. We have two questions from the audience and then I'll conclude with one about what insights that we can share for people who do frontline risk management every day. The first question from the audience is, We've talked a bit about externalities, the way that investor behavior affects individuals. Are there other measures of risk that would better capture the various externalities caused by investment decisions? Ben, I see you nodding your head, so perhaps you can lead off. Oh, it's such a good question. That's all. Um, I'm not sure I have an answer, um, but that's ex ex exactly the, the the right way. I, uh, to, to be thinking about it, um, and and that's exactly the way that that EY as a firm is is trying to think about it in terms of long term value. When when we advise our clients on on their risk management practices, uh, the the shift to stakeholder capitalism means that we need to be thinking about exactly those externalities. And so I don't think that's an answer, but it's an acknowledgement that I think it's it's a very apt question. Brian, do you have any thoughts? I would just jump in there and say. I think you, you, you have to look at the externalities of investment decisions going forward, but also briefly looking backwards as well. Mm. I think all too often when we're doing our, our, our there's there some very thoughtful investors, I think who do a really good job of learning from prior cycles and decisions and evaluate those impacts along the way versus those investors who only look forward and who only think about those uh, impacts um, that that are are forward looking and in, in, in the near or, or longer term. I think that the best way to help try to mitigate that is let, let's let's keep a small rearview mirror. Let's not get stuck in the past as investors. Let's let's take what we've learned to then help shape our investment decisions around risk going forward. Thank you, Julie. Would you like to turn at that idea? I would just say, um, you know, we, we are spending so much time thinking about the ESG framework and including that is one way, uh, you know, as we evaluate companies, this is now part and parcel of our framework. And I think that that's something yeah. I just want to add to what has already been some, some good. Thank you. There's the second question. Raleigh takes that theme, Julie. It has a predicate and then the question itself. So here's the setup. If the volatility of employment has risen through the labor markets and the volatility of retirement has risen through the shift to defined contribution and the volatility of government payments has risen due to polarized politics, what can capital markets be doing to mitigate that volatility? Is it simply a matter of getting more money into equity markets? Is it a matter of restructuring the way that we save? Is it something else? Joey, perhaps I'll stay with you and see if you have any thoughts to add in that domain and then go back in reverse order to Brian and Ben. So I would say um, really 
I believe the next five to 10 years, there's going to be material differences in these policies across the globe. So I would really think about this framework globally and see how you can mitigate some of this by, by your allocations across these areas. The second thing I want to just point out is, um, you know, often the choice is between equities and bonds, but Brian mentioned it a little earlier. I think real assets have become uh, something that a lot of people are considering as another asset class to um, mitigate some of this. So two thoughts there. Brian? I, I would just say quickly take a different approach to answering the question uh, from the individual perspective. Uh, I would say there there should be a greater focus on uh, financial literacy and, and education and, and understanding from from the, the investor or the, the, the individual. But I think the responsibility for the institutional investor is to to be to be thoughtful and transparent and commun communicative in their thoughts around risk and investment decisions to help the end user understand those considerations that are both that are global uh, that that impact uh, those those decisions. So um, I, I think we we as this as we're doing here today have to more broadly raise the bar on understanding. That's an interesting point, Ben. Your thoughts on that question? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. I think you know the the role of corporate governance is is um, underappreciated here, and uh, there's a lot more that investors could do uh, it, through their their uh, you know taking board seats and other shareholder voting mechanisms in order to promote uh, uh, better behavior. Um, you know, just look look through the crisis. Stock market's up. CEO pay is up. Right. Uh, uh, those are uh, if you think about the hierarchy, the stack of, of segments of our society. Well, we know they're at the top because they're they're doing the best. And we know that underprivileged communities are at the bottom. And so, um, you know, in, when the way firms uh, when investors take board seats, they've already led this shift toward, towards climate change. They can broaden that and think more holistically about sustainability. Uh, and, and I think put a lot of a lot of pressure for, for good there. Thank you. We're nearing the very end of our time. I'll get in one more question and we can use it as a conclusion. So feel free to answer that question or do the good panelist thing and use it as an opportunity to offer whatever other thoughts you may like. The folks on the panel today are not day-to-day -day risk managers. We're people who are teammates to them, but this is a series in a line of research for people who manage risk. I'm curious, what's forefront of your mind, the one thing that we can offer to our colleagues who do this day to day based on the conversation today? What's one offering that we can give to them? I'll go, Brian, with you first, if that's all right. Absolutely, I'll just quickly say alignment. Uh, focus the alignment of your risk framework with the organizational and investment objectives in your fiduciary duty. When there's, and recognizing those will be different for different institutions at different time frames, but proper alignment mm -hmm. is my one closing comment to keep the risk decision and investment decision process uh, tied to uh, the overall value creation. Julie? I would say focus on more unexpected events taking place. We are seeing some extremes in terms yeah. of uh, inequality and what we're seeing in society. And I think that those tend to be uh, times when we, when we see outcomes that we don't tend to expect. So keep that in mind as you make decisions. Sure, Ben, last word. Um, I would say you know, the, the coming wave of, of uh, transformation that worries me is automation which uh, might inject the whole host of volatility into household income. And so for investors who can influence companies, I think you, the, the most important thing is to encourage reskilling or upskilling of employees who are gonna be made, made uh, redundant as a result of these investments in technology. We need to retrain these people and redeploy them back into the labor market. This feels like an important conversation. We appreciate each of you being part of it. Just for the audience again today, we've heard from Julie Dawan, the chief economist at Wellington from Ben Falk, director at EYQ, the in-house think tank of EY, and Brian Lewis, the chief investment officer from US Steel. Thanks to each of you for being part of the panel today. 
I want to also make a point of thanking Bren Costello, again, our producer for this series, without whom none of this would be technologically possible. By way of reminder, FCLT Global convenes these webinars and indeed does all of our work for the purpose of moving money in longer term directions, having impact. If you've heard anything today that you think might help you do that, or if our other research you think may be helpful, I encourage you to reach out to me directly at matthew.leatherman at fcltglobal.org. All of that research is available on our website at the same domain backslash resources. We will convene again in one month on the 10th of March. Our special guest that day will be Mark Kritzman, who founded the firm Wyndham Capital and has also been very instrumental both at MIT and State Street Associates. Mark will be talking with us one-on-one -on -one very much about that point of unexpected events and how we navigate crises. Our thanks to each of you for being in the audience today for our webinar, and we look forward to seeing you in one month. Thank you and good day.